Well, hello, xenographers everywhere, and welcome to another episode. Not long ago, film cameras were consigned to the dustbin of history, and it was difficult at one point even to give them away. But in recent years, film seems to have had something of a renaissance, and many people have realised that we shouldn't be in too much of a hurry to throw away a tried, tested and developed technology with a very unique aesthetic. Films become very popular among artists. It's popular with photography students. And it's also popular with a lot of photographers who grew up with film and still like to shoot the odd roll or two. And buying a film camera brings the added bonus that you can use the lens on a digital mirrorless body. I think it's important for every photographer to have some experience with a manual camera because once you learn to shoot manual, you understand light and you understand what your camera is doing. It makes you a better photographer. So here are my five top picks for manual film cameras that you can buy today. So to begin with, I'm going to start with the Leica 3. This is an iconic camera and it came in many and various guises. It was built from around about 1932 right up until 1958 and it went through various models and iterations over those years but essentially the cameras are very very similar. They were all rangefinder cameras and this one dates from 1936. It's a beautiful little machine. The quality of the workmanship is second to none. The body is made to a very high standard. The lens is really something else. I've never quite seen a lens that performs the way this one does. It just seems to play with light in a very, very unique manner. It's really sharp. It renders colours beautifully. It gives you a little bit of swirl. And the quality of the out-of-focus areas in the shot is absolutely beautiful. This lens is second to none. The cameras all have the 39mm screw mount and there's a massive range of lenses to choose from. There are all the Leica lenses plus the Russian lenses. There are Japanese lenses that will mount to this camera. There are English lenses that will mount to this camera. There's simply a massive range to choose from. Like all rangefinder cameras from this time, the minimum focus distance is three feet or one meter. So you're not gonna to get too close to your subject. This isn't a camera for macro shots or anything approaching macro, but use it within its limits. It's a beautiful little performer. The lens is collapsible and when it's collapsed the camera has very small dimensions indeed it will go into a pocket admittedly a fairly largish pocket but the beauty of this camera is that it's very small and portable that was a selling point when these cameras were new and it's still a selling point today there are very few 35 mil cameras that have the small dimensions that these Leicas have Later ones were very slightly larger, but only by a matter of a couple of millimetres or so. So if you want something that's really pocketable, really portable, and of very, very high quality, this is the one to go for. Now, of course, Leica's a premium brand, so these cameras and lenses are not the cheapest out there. Having said that, they're not the most expensive either. A good one of these with a lens will cost you anything from between three to four hundred pounds, possibly slightly less, possibly slightly more, but in that area. And that, in my view, is money well spent. This little machine is well worth it. And when you handle one and come to appreciate its virtues, I think you'll probably agree. So next up, we've got the Zorki 4 and 4K, both made in Russia by KMZ from the mid 50s to round about the early 90s. The 4 and 4K are essentially the same camera except the 4 has a knob wind where the 4K has a lever wind so the 4K is that bit more convenient. It's a rangefinder camera and it traces its roots 
back to the original Leica II of 1932. This is a Russian development of that original Leica design, so it's got lots of Leica DNA. It has the Leica type cloth shutter, it has an L39 thread mount for its lenses, so you can mount a huge array of lenses, the same that you can on the Leicas. It usually comes with the Jupiter 8 lens, which is an f2 lens. It's a fantastic little piece of glass. I've used it very extensively. And in use, this camera and lens are very, very similar to using a Leica. In some ways, it's better than the early Leicas because it has a combined rangefinder and viewfinder window, which means that you don't have to keep moving between windows to focus and compose like you do on the Leica. Is it as good as the Leica? Well, it's 95% as good. And the difference is so small that you won't really notice it. You certainly won't notice it in the final images. Make no mistake, this is a high quality piece of kit. It's a high quality lens. And the fact that so many Zorkies are still around is a testament to their quality. They're not as well finished as the Leica. The whole philosophy behind their production was different. The Leica was a premium product for people able to pay premium prices. The Zorki was a people's camera. It sold at people's camera prices when it was new and it still does today. You can buy a good example of a Zorki 4 or 4K for anywhere between 40 to 70 pounds. Anybody who's familiar with Leica bodies will be able to repair it should it need repair. And there are so many around that they're very easy to replace. As with the Leica, you're not going to get closer than three feet to your subjects. And using it, by and large, is a very similar experience to using the Leica. This is definitely an old school camera. This camera will offer you the rangefinder experience for a very affordable price. And for that, you'll get a quality machine that will last as long as you want it to last. And personally, I think this camera has a really cool aesthetic. I think it's a very good looking camera, especially in the later 4K version, as this one is. It's a very interesting piece of industrial design, and there's something that just works about it. And all in all, this camera is one of the biggest bargains of the range finder world. Now, if you want something a little more up to date, you're probably going to want to try an SLR. So here's an SLR produced in Russia from around about 1965 or so, right up until the early 90s. And that's the Zenit camera. It too traces its roots back to the Leica of the early 30s because in itself it was a development of the Zorki 4 with the rangefinder taken out and a mirror box added. These cameras get a bad press because they really are stripped down. They're very heavy, they're quite large, but this camera has a trick up its sleeve and that's what it wears on the front because mounted on most Zenit cameras you will find a Helios 44 or 44 II. The Helios has become a cult lens and, in my opinion, deservedly so. It's an exact copy of the 1930s Zeiss Biotar, and the images it will make are just stunning. It's a very sharp lens and it's one of the lenses that gives the most pronounced amount of swirl in the background blur. Now I know that's not everybody's cup of tea, but I like it very much. I think it's a wonderful effect and I think it adds a really interesting aesthetic to any images you make with it. It focuses down to 30 centimeters so you can get pretty close and because it has an M42 mount it will mount on a huge range of cameras from the 60s and 70s. The camera itself is a little bit agricultural. It's not particularly well finished although it's well made. These cameras have stood the test of time, they continue to operate and they're reasonably easy to repair if they go wrong because they're so simple. It does have a light meter built in, you can see the selenium cell 
on the front there just above the lens and that means you don't have to go fiddling and faffing about with exposure meters. When you look through the viewfinder you're seeing directly through the lens so you can see exactly what you're going to get in your final image. Not always possible with a rangefinder especially when you're shooting up close. Don't be put off by some of the sometimes slightly disparaging remarks that are made about this camera. If you compare it to a Nikon or an Olympus SLR it does feel a little rough but the important thing is it makes fantastic pictures. After all isn't that what photography is about? Like the Zorkies these cameras have stood the test of time and they are very very cheap to buy. You can buy a good working example of one of these from anywhere between 20 to 60 pounds. In my view money well spent. Next up then we've got the Olympus OM-1. This is a particular favourite of mine. It's a beautiful little camera, little being the operative word. This camera is really small. When you compare it to a Nikon or a Canon you will see the difference very clearly. And that small form factor enabled Olympus to sell a huge amount of these cameras when it was new. This is a really, really well made camera. The standard of its engineering, the quality of its finish are really second to none. It does have a few quirks. The shutter speed dial, for example, is situated right at the back of the lens, nestling right next to the camera body. But it's still a simple, easy to operate, manual only camera. It has a light meter built in and you can read the reading from the meter inside the viewfinder. So it's very easy to change aperture and shutter speed to get your exposure correct and get the shot. There is however a caveat with this camera in that original batteries contained mercury and are no longer allowed. The mercury cell had a voltage of 1.3 volts so while you can replace it with a modern button cell that cell will give you 1.5 volts and so the exposure won't be quite accurate. You can buy a cell called a Veen cell which has the correct voltage but they don't last too long so my workaround is just to fit a 1.5 volt battery and adjust the exposure accordingly. Open up maybe a third to a half a stop more and you shouldn't go too far wrong. The lenses for this camera are legendary. It uses the Zuiko lenses and if you've seen other videos on this channel you'll know that I'm a big fan of these. They're not particularly expensive, they come in a very very wide range, they all give great colour rendition and they're all really well made. Would I be going too far in describing this little camera as beautiful? Well, personally, I don't think I would. I think that word can be fairly applied. It's a lovely little machine and you can find a good one of these with an f1.8 50mm lens for anywhere between 100 to 150 pounds. Find a good one of these and you will not regret it. Finally we come to one of the best engineered, one of the best made film SLRs that there has ever been. That's the Nikon FM. This thing is a beauty. Or is it a beast? I can't quite tell. Whatever the case, this is a fantastic camera. There's a massive range of lenses for these cameras. Some of them, like this Series E lens, are very affordable indeed. They'll mount all Nikon lenses from as far as I understand it round about the mid to late 50s. The experience of using this camera is absolutely wonderful. Everything just seems right about it. The controls all fall very easily to hand. The viewfinder is big, clear and bright and overall it's just a delight to use. Despite its bigger size, I actually find this camera easier to use than the OM-1, although that's a matter of personal taste of course. When you pick one of these up and use it, the quality of engineering will become immediately apparent. Everything works smoothly, the controls work softly and smoothly, it has a titanium shutter, 
It's all metal. There's no plastic used in its construction anywhere apart from one or two very minor parts. If this camera were a car, it would be a 70s Rolls Royce or an 80s Mercedes Benz. Always there, always ready to go, reliable, over-engineered and with a simplicity that you just don't find on modern cameras. There's nothing on this camera to get in the way of the photographic experience. It's just the camera, the photographer, the light and two exposure controls. You can't get simpler than that. And simplicity is a tremendous benefit in any machine. It's no more simple than any of the other cameras we've looked at today. But it just seems to all come together in this one. And you're left with, at the risk of using a cliche, an experience that is genuinely zen-like. And this one just might be the nicest film SLR ever made. As far as cost goes, they're really not particularly that expensive. A good one of these can be found for between 100 and £150. This one is a beaut. Buy one, try it, you will not regret it. So there we are, five fine film cameras. Some cheap and simple, others more expensive, but still simple. And that simplicity is important. In my view, the less that gets in the way of your photography, the better. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. I hope it's been useful. Don't forget to like and subscribe. As ever, thanks for watching. And I'll see you next time for some more Xenography.